that this Assembly expresses deep concern at the levels of domestic abuse, rape and sexual crime, encourages victims of these crimes to come forward, welcomes the increased reporting of domestic abuse, rape and sexual crime, but recognises that a high level of under-reporting still exists. Further welcomes the commitment from the Minister of Health and the Minister of Justice to prioritise addressing this type of crime and calls on the Executive to work together to support victims and survivors and address domestic abuse, rape and sexual crime. Thank you. I call Jennifer McCann to move the motion. Can I say at the outset, I'm, I'm glad of the opportunity to bring this important debate with my uh, party colleagues to the floor of the House. Um, we'd just like to say that we welcome both amendments um, that have been tabled today as well. In a recent survey carried out by the European Union's Fundamental Rights Agency, it was reported that out of all of the European regions, Ireland had the second highest number of women avoiding places or situations for fear of being assaulted. And recent statistics released by the PSNI has said that there has been a rise of 61% in sexual offences over the past six years, with a year-on-year -year increase. And we did, um, uh, as members of the policing board, we did question the chief constable um, uh, in the public session on that issue. This, alongside the rise in the numbers of people accessing violent sexual images of children and in child sexual exploitation cases, and the fact that one in every four women have experienced some form of domestic abuse in their lifetime has to be a concern for us all. While some of the increase in those statistics can be attributed to more people reporting these crimes, it is a well-known fact that domestic abuse, rape and sexual crime are still very much underreported and hidden. I believe there is a need for political direction to ensure that a clear and consistent message is provided which encourages victims to report these type of assaults alongside a coordinated approach which provides access to services and the supports that they need. I want to welcome the recent statements by the Ministers for Health and the Ministers for Justice that they will be making domestic abuse and sexual crime a priority for both their departments and in particular welcome the commitment to bring forward legislation to deal with coercive and controlling forms of abuse as well as physical abuse. The impact of domestic abuse, rape and sexual crime on individuals and families is devastating. And victims and survivors can be left with the physical scars, but also long-term effects on their mental health and emotional well-being. And it is important that mental, emotional and psychological abuse is also recognised as well as physical abuse. The impact is far-reaching, not only for the individual victims and their families, but for society in general. And while it's those individuals who feel the worst effects in terms of their physical and mental health, it has been estimated that domestic violence costs the Irish economy 2.2 billion euros a year in the south and 180 million pounds here in the north. Violence and abuse can take many forms, and while victims can be male or female, it is mostly women and children that are affected, and 90% of the perpetrators are men. Very often, children can be the forgotten victims of domestic violence, and many of them can witness violent attacks or be, in the, or be the victims of physical abuse themselves in the home at a very young age. As we make greater advances in the use of the internet, it presents more and more danger for our children and our young people to be exploited and abused. And there is a very real need to try to keep children safe on the internet, and some of the large organizations with responsibility for the internet and social networking have a role to play here as well. Over the years, one of the key areas of prevention has been identified as preventing it happening in the first place and changing public attitudes to, towards it. Organisations like Women's Aid have been involved in delivering programmes in schools to ensure that children don't believe that violence in the home is acceptable or is normal behaviour. And it is important that any public awareness campaign is coordinated in a way that provides support and access to services for all victims and survivors. Training programmes for organisations and agencies involved in tackling domestic violence will also ensure a more coordinated approach. There is no doubt that the starting work carried out by Women's Aid and similar organisations and the availability of refuges and their 24-hour domestic and sexual violence helpline has and will continue to save people's lives. 
and that partnership working and interagency support will help ensure that adequate provision of refuges and services to support those victims are maintained and developed upon. It is a sad fact that violence against women and children has become almost endemic in our society, and it is important for us to challenge the sexist attitudes that allows women to be treated as less than equal than that of our male counterparts. It is also important that we challenge the structural and societal inequalities that can result in women and girls in particular being discriminated against. As community and political representatives, we need to ensure that the policies and the strategies of government departments are enforced with vigour and translated into action on the ground to com combat these crimes. And that yes. Would the member agree that a culture of silence often attends in the aftermath of these horrendous crimes? And indeed, is the member a fit person to be making this proposal? Since in 2005, she was advised by Maria Cachel of the allegation of rape against her, and she did not report it to the police. Is that not the real test of sincerity and probity in these matters? I, my response to that is well documented in this chamber and outside this chamber. Can I say, I mean, I think it's disgraceful that the member would use something, a debate like this, disgraceful that you did that today, and we're trying to actually send a clear message of support out of this chamber. The PSNI and the criminal justice system has to make women and young girls feel safe and confident about coming forward to report these crimes. Survivors need to know that they will have access to justice and that the perpetrators will serve sentences that will reflect the devastating effects that their crimes have had on their victims. I believe that we can, um, Mr Deputy Speaker, send a clear message out from this chamber today that domestic abuse, rape and sexual violence is wrong in all the forms that it takes and that we will ensure, whether it is physical, psychological or emotional, that all victims and survivors have access to the support services if and when they need them. Thank you. Uh, I call Claire Bailey to move amendment number one. Deputy Speaker, I, up, I welcome the opportunity to contribute to this vitally important debate and to move this amendment on behalf of the Green Party. I'd like to, think, like to thank the original proposers of the motion for bringing further focus on this really important issue. There are two amendments to this motion, um, and the second motion I feel changes the intent of the original motion by reducing any focused actions called for to deal solely within the realm of domestic violence over rape and sexual crimes. Given the Minister for Justice's recent commitments to bring forward legislation on coercive control, I feel we should not lose sight of the great need to focus on and include action on the wider abuses of rape and sexual crime. Before I was elected as an MLA in May, I worked for a charity, Nexus NI. Many of you will be familiar with this charity, who worked to support the victims and survivors of sexual abuse and rape. I want to take this opportunity to pay tribute to that organisation and others working in this field, such as Women's Aid and the Men's Advisory Project, as well as a host of others. Many of these charities are under significant pressure with the current funding climate. They are operating significantly above their capacity and deliver above and beyond what they're funded for. We have well-established evidence that the austerity programme continues to disproportionately impact on women and children, and this impact is significantly seen within this sector. Prior to this debate, members of the House were provided with a briefing pack. Contained within this pack was research completed, completed by the RAISE team in 2015 and my request asking to give a statistical analysis of rape cases in the criminal justice system in Northern Ireland. A key point from this paper states, an analysis of final prosecutorial decisions between 2010 and 2014 shows that in 83% of cases, there were recommendations for no prosecutions. That's a shocking figure. I'm also aware that some members in the House have questioned if they can support this amendment over concerns of the wording used. 
So there is a need to understand what constitutes an allegation and what constitutes a case, and I welcome the opportunity to explain this. I have spoken to police officers today in the Serious Crime Unit in Garnerville to just make sure that I'm on the right tracks here. So an allegation is a claim made by another person. This can be made to a friend, a family member, a counsellor, or indeed the police. The difference being that once received, the PSNI will investigate this allegation and build a case. Each case is then forwarded to the Public Prosecution Service with or without a recommendation for prosecution. It is the PPS then who make the final decision to bring a case to court or not. For example, in 2011, the PPS received 440 cases of rape from the PSNI involving 465 suspects. Only 218 of those cases received were recommended for prosecution, yet the same year we have seen only 77 cases brought to court by our PPS. So to clarify, all allegations of rape or any crime that are made to the police will be investigated, even if the person making the allegation wants to make a case or not because the PSNI have a commitment to public safety. Therefore, all reported rapes in the criminal justice system are cases. Given that 83% of those cases between the years of 2010 and 14 were not recommended for prosecution, it is no wonder that we continue to have such low reporting of sexual offences. To come forward and report an allegation of a sexual or domestic crime in the knowledge that if investigated by the police and brought to the prosecutors for consideration, you are overwhelmingly likely to have your case dismissed. In the year 2015 to 16, there were 3,128 sexual offences recorded by the PSNI. That equates to almost nine sexual offences per day in Northern Ireland. That is only those that are recorded. This was an increase of 12.1% compared to the previous year. Over the same time period, despite increased reporting and subsequent recording by the police, there was a drop in outcomes of 2.7%, with only 13.7% of recorded sexual offences leading to any outcome. These outcomes include charges, summons, cautions, community resolutions, penalty notice for disorder, offences taken into consideration, and indictable only offences where no action was taken against the offender. The Certainly. The member I presume recognises that the test for prosecution is this exactly the same in a sexual offence as any other offence, namely whether or not there's a reasonable prospect of conviction. And is it not a reality that in sexual abuse cases, they mostly are instances of one word against another, and those present great difficulties to any prosecutor in determining that there's a reasonable prospect of conviction? So is that not one of the underlying reasons why there is a disproportionate number of lesser prosecutions, not because of some systemic aversion to prosecuting, but because the test, as it must be, has to be applied across the board, whatever the offence is. Thank the member for his Order comments. Can remind members that um, uh, interventions should be uh, uh, concise. And that's probably an issue to take up with the Public Prosecution Office and see how they can better work with the, pub, with the police in order to get a stronger case. Because I think that the, the levels of prosecution in Northern Ireland are not comparable with other jurisdictions, both in the UK or within Europe. But given the current context, I think uh, that Northern Ireland also sees a problem of uh, the number of women in public life in Northern Ireland. Um, and I'm also in no doubt that this issue is one of the main factors. And what of those women who become pregnant as a result of rape? In Northern Ireland, we are not currently human rights compliant with our laws on termination. 
Instead, we choose to further traumatise women by giving them no choice when it comes to choosing whether they want to continue with that pregnancy or not. We could easily read the statistics to show that a woman in Northern Ireland is actually more likely to be pregnant as a result of rape than ever facing her abuser in a court of law. So what actions can the PPS do? Well, in England and Wales, the End in Violence Against Women and Girls strategy has led to the Crown Prosecution Service recognising violence against women and girls as a key priority, and the P CPS publishes detailed breakdown of data on sexual offences, something that we do not yet do here in Northern Ireland. I would like to make my first ask of the Executive is to ensure that the PPS provides a further breakdown of this data, which might go some way to addressing the members' concerns. The Public Prosecution Service is a non-ministerial governmental department and should be accountable on this issue. The Criminal Justice Inspectorate conducted a thematic review in 2010 and followed this up in 2013. In the 2013 follow-up, it found that of its 12 recommendations, seven were achieved, three partially achieved, and two not achieved. They also committed to a full thematic inspection in 2015. The recommendations not achieved were that the PSNI should take steps to improve communications and intelligence sharing between teams within the public prosecution units. And the other was that the police should fully adopt the principles and recommendations of the National Crime Investigators Development Programme and appoint appropriately experienced and trained tutor detectives in order to better support and supervise trainee investigators appropriately whilst they're undergoing training. Of the three who's who, that were partially achieved, one was in relation to support staff for those investigating in this area and the other two related to the PPS. This was in relation to ensuring videotaped interviews as a primary tool. And the second was where the council was instructed to hold conferences between prosecutor, council and police to explore overcoming any difficulties. The full 2015 review has still not happened and it is, in, it is within the gift of the Minister for Justice to instruct a review at any time. I would urge her that she should instruct the Criminal Justice Inspectorate as priority. The impact on the life choices for many victims should not be ignored. I ask the member to draw her remarks to a conclusion. The, P the Probation Board do much ongoing work and other agencies help in dealing with the aftermath, but as a society we need to hang our heads in shame at the disgraceful figure. When we acknowledge and do nothing about it, we are complicit in it. Order. I beg Members, this time is up. Thank you very much. To indeed. support the amendment. Thank you. I call Mr. Mark Durkin to move amendment number two. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I rise today to propose the tabled amendment from the STLP to this welcome motion, which should concentrate all of our minds and efforts on alleviating the suffering of victims and survivors of these heinous crimes and on reducing the number of people, women and men, subjected to this physical and mental torture in the first place. We think that our amendment adds to the motion, calling for immediate practical steps that can be taken, as well as legislative steps that can be taken in a relatively small time frame that will have a really big impact in protecting victims from further sustained abuse. We do also welcome the Green Party amendment. I do not think anyone could oppose it. However, I do regret that we do not have before the House today a motion or amendment combining the two. The appallingly low rates for rape prosecution and conviction, as highlighted by the previous speaker, are really shocking. In fact, they are worse than shocking, they are really saddening. And while the motion, quite rightly, encourages victims to come forward, what confidence can any victim have that justice will be done, that it will be in any way reliving that anguish and pain? Some may find it even harder to bring themselves to report a rape following the fallout of the Chad Evans case over the weekend. I am not commenting on the verdict, but the hysteria around it 
and the ill-informed opinions emanating from barroom barristers and cyberspace solicitors, not to mention the online and offline identification and abuse of a victim, is sure to scare some people off actually reporting a rape, and we cannot afford to let this happen. We need the PPS to work to improve prosecution and conviction rates, to give victims and survivors faith in the system. And we all need to work together, not just the executive, to support victims and survivors, to give them back faith in humanity. I'll move on now to our amendment. Uh, there has been a very positive public response to Minister Sugden's statement early in her ministry that domestic violence and abuse would be a key priority during her tenure. And her announcement on The View last Thursday night that it is her intention to capture coercive and controlling behaviour will also have been well received by any right-minded person, even one who just drafted an amendment calling on her to do just that. However, far from being rendered obsolete as a result of this announcement, our amendment has become all the more relevant. The amendment asks the Minister to extend the Justice Support Worker Scheme to ensure that patterns of abuse can be identified, which will mean that when she does bring forward the legislation to capture controlling and coercive behaviour, she will be able to criminalise patterns of abuse and coercive control. Coercive control is a calculated pattern of psychologically abusive and controlling behaviour designed to isolate, manipulate and terrorise a victim into complete fearful submission. I know if he was in the chamber this would all sound familiar to Mr McCann, who I don't think it's any secret, he's a huge fan of the archers. After that shows gripping Rob and Helen's storyline that did so much to actually highlight this very sensitive and important issue. But sadly, domestic abuse isn't confined to our airwaves, nor is domestic abuse manifested only through physical violence. Often, physical attacks occur only after a victim has been cut off from support networks, emotionally abused and manipulated to the point that they are more likely to just accept physical violence or are too afraid to leave. Many of us will know people who have been through this. More worryingly, many of us will know people who are going through this and we don't even realise it. Studies have proven similarities between coercive control and political terrorism. We must salute the courage of victims who have managed to break free of the shackles of such relationships and we must do everything in our power to give more power to more victims to do the same. We must also acknowledge, as have previous speakers, the fantastic work of so many individuals and organisations who support victims. Victim Support, Men's Action Network, Men's Advisory Project, Nexus and more. Recently, a new organisation in my own constituency set up to help victims of such abuse, La Dolce Vita, was uh, awarded official charitable status. I would also give a particular mention to Foil Women's Aid, for whom this year marks their 40th anniversary. That is 40 years of helping women and families in distress. And every year, they are having to help more women and families in distress. I would also take this and every opportunity to re-emphasise to the Minister the need for Foil Women's Aid's One Safe Place in Pump Street in my city and the need for the executive to support that much needed project. Our amendment focuses upon extending the provision of the Justice Support Worker Scheme to all policing districts. We have consulted with Women's Aid on this amendment and based the wording on their calls and the calls of other groups. They want to see the introduction of the scheme to all policing districts across the North and effective legislation to criminalise coercive control and the pattern of abuse to which victims are subjected by their abusers. 
So what are these justice support workers? They are specialist domestic violence support workers for victims who are engaging with police and the criminal justice system. There are currently justice support workers in only three policing areas here. There's two in Belfast and one in Derry, as it happens, supported through inconsistent part funding. It is a shame that not all victims of domestic abuse have access to this vital support. The extension of the scheme would have a hugely beneficial impact on victims. It will enable better access to justice, facilitate early engagement with specialist support, reduce re-traumatisation of victims and ultimately, perhaps, save lives. The workers' role includes accepting referrals directly from the PSNI and acting as a liaison between victims and officers to ensure a coordinated and timely response to requests for information from victims. They provide support to engage with the criminal justice system by acclimatising victims to the courts and meetings with solicitors, and they encourage engagement with police. Furthermore, these workers ensure that all possible additional avenues for support are communicated to victims and accessed if and when required. In terms of this, I have recently raised with the Health Minister the completely unacceptable waiting times for counselling services right across our trusts. There has been an overwhelmingly positive response about the impact of justice support workers from police and most importantly, from victims. Expanding their role, as our amendment proposes, has the support of Nexus, Men's Action Network, Victim Support, Men's Advisory Project, Women's Aid and others. It would be a shame if it did not now get the support of this Assembly. I propose the amendment. I call Paul Frew. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And uh, I, again, I rise in support of the, the motion from the member from West Belfast, and of course the the amendments uh, uh, from both uh, members. Uh, I see merit in both. I, 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 I agree with the comments from the member that if they could be conjoined in some way, then that would maybe add to a better amendment all complete. But we are where we are, and I think the message has to leave this chamber today that this house is an agreement. There's something more needs done. Can I just put on record early on that I support the Minister 100 per cent in her uh, uh, statements around this being her number one priority. It is indeed one of five priorities that the Justice Committee have laid down for this mandate uh, to, to try and uh, resolve this issue and to protect victims and survivors better uh, when they are in, indeed involved in this horrendous a crime. Domestic abuse now uh, accounting for two and a half times as many crimes as those linked to drugs. We have to set up and take notice. And I believe, I think we've seen a trend, even in the, since we've come back from recess. We, first of all, we had Brenda Hales, my colleague's motion on stalking. I think the very first week we were back, and now we've got this. The pressure on the Minister has been immense in this regard. And I know and I support the Minister in her uh, assertions that she will tackle this and treat this as her number one priority. I believe the community out there and society out there demands it of us to bring forward new legislation, to support that legislation, certainly to scrutinise it, but to make sure at the other end with legislation, good legislation, that will keep people, keep, keep people safer and also to make sure and ensure that people then are brought to justice. At the minute, we're sitting with laws that were uh, brought in in the 1990s. The Family Homes and Domestic Violence Northern Ireland Order 1998 is the legislative framework which allows victims of domestic abuse to apply for protective civil orders and non molestation orders in a civil setting. And the protection from harassment, Northern Ireland Order 1997, is the legislation where victims of stalking have to look to. And that's my point. We need direct it. We need direct uh, a legislation to deal with this crime. This crime is complex. It is not just domestic violence. If we try and tackle domestic violence on its own, we will fail. 
and we will fail our victims and survivors. It is as much to do with a coercive, coercive behaviour, controlling behaviour, as it is the domestic violence. Because if you have the fear of the violence, you will do pretty much what you're told to do, especially if there's young people in that house. That is essential that we tackle coercive control. And if we tackle that, it will mean there will be more convictions on the domestic violence front. We have no laws on stalking yet. We have to go look towards harassment. That is not, that is not capable legislation to cover stalking. That needs change. And I would plead with the Minister, when she's looking at this, that she puts this together uh, and tries to deal with the issue in one raft of legislation. We have no laws yet on coercive behaviour. That needs to change. We have been talking for, about this for so many years. The Minister has only had post a couple of months. But we have been talking about this for many years. Justice officials know we have been talking about this for many years. And I will turn my attention to the Department. Where are our VOPOs? The people who work in this field, who protects people on a day-to-day -day basis, are crying out for VOPOs, violent offences prevention orders. We have been promised them. We have not yet received them. Even when I brought amendments on coercive behaviour on Wednesday the 10th of February 2016 in the Justice No. 2 Bill, I was given commitments by the then Minister that these would be going in very, very soon. I withdrew that amendment because I want good law, not bad law. And I want to see action. I want to see movement. Cogs turn far too slowly and people are becoming victimised as we speak. Although we do have SOPOs, we can see how well they work. We need VOPOs in as quickly as possible because they can be issued even without the consent of the victim. They are a tool that is the essential piece in the kit, in the toolbox, which our officials need to use. I would ask the member to draw his remarks to a close. I, I'll end it there. Thank you very much. I call Doug Beatty. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Thank you, Mr. S um, Speaker. Um, if I could first start by saying I find this an incredibly difficult um, deba debate. I, I find it disturbing. Uh, as, a, as a father and a grandfather, um, uh, I look at my daughter and my grandchildren and imagine them being abused, and, and, and it really does make my blood boil uh, and churns uh, my stomach. Uh, I welcome the motion which is coming before uh, the floor. Um, I mean, what's there not to support? Um, everything in it must be supported. But I, but I have to say, and nobody will thank me for saying this, um, uh, and I can already see the eyes rolling and, uh, and, and the head shaking and the sucking of teeth. Um, but Sinn Féin's words do not match their actions. If they had started this debate by saying, do you know what? We got this wrong in the past. We're sorry, but let's move forward. Then I would understand it. The treatment of Maria Cahill, of Pordy McGahan, was truly disgraceful. And they have to acknowledge that. I am haunted by the words. Some abusers can be so manipulated that some victims enjoy the abuse. It's terrible. It turns me. And I don't want to dwell on it, but it is the elephant in the room and it has to be addressed. Please address it. If I look at the motion and I dissect the motion, and I will dissect the motion very, very briefly, the Assembly expresses deep concern at the level of domestic abuse, rape, and sexual crime. Absolutely. And we should all be standing up in unison and saying this has got to stop. Sex crimes have soared by 60% in the last six years. And you can look at all different reasons for it. You can talk about the ability to get online or online pornography. Um, whatever it is, we must address that. Domestic crime accounts for 13% of all crime in Northern Ireland. 13%. 13,500 domestic crimes is what the PSNI had to deal with in the last 12 months. And remembering, of course, that normally a domestic crime happens about 30 to 35 times before it's even reported. That's the tip of the iceberg. The motion goes on, encourages victims to come forward, welcomes an increased reporting, but recognises that a high level of underreporting still exists. Yes, 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 to all three of those. 
and it's important that we look at them. We look at them as statistics, but every one is a story. I recently listened to Terry Louise Graham's testimony, which I find incredibly harrowing. Incredibly harrowing. And we all need to look at that to see what domestic abuse is really all about, what coercive behaviour is really all about. And recently I met uh, Alicia Perry from Women's Aid NI, she's one of their new ambassadors, and I listened to her story. And that's another story that we all need to know. So we do need a strategy in regards to this. And what I would say is this. I don't want anybody to have to report rape or domestic, uh, domestic abuse. So we need a form of education. So I call on the education minister to instigate a programme to educate young boys at the age of 15 or 16 about what domestic abuse is all about, what rape is about, and tell girls that they have the power to say no. I looked at the Justice Minister and I asked her to, to fast-track legislation, to particularly domestic abuse, because it makes absolutely no sense that somebody suffering um, domestic abuse can be assaulted five times by the same person, but have five different cases and have to go to court five different times. It doesn't make sense. And I look at the Communities Minister to commission public information, adverts, leaflets, and set aside housing so that when we have a case of domestic abuse, we can get the woman out with their children and put them in the housing away from the problem. It calls on the executive to work together to support victims and survivors and address domestic abuse, rape and sexual crime. Well, come on, let's get on with it. There's only two parties in the executive. Let's get on with it. And I welcome the Justice Minister's recent comments about domestic abuse, as I welcome my friend, Mr. Fru, uh, as the Chairman of the Justice Committee and the Deputy uh, of the Justice Committee on their strong stance on coercive control. Would ask the member to draw and I would ask us all to look to Women's Aid and involve them. I support the motion. Uh, and I support the amendment of the Greens. Thank you. Hiram Sir Trevor Lund. I call Trevor Lund. Uh, Gormay Agat, last come calling you. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, can I thank, first of all, Mrs. McCann, Ms. Bailey, and Mr. Durkin for bringing these motions on behalf of their parties. Uh, we, we have no problem with supporting any of them. Uh, in whatever order they, they come up, we would. Um, I think Amendment 1 will probably be called first. Perhaps that will go through. It doesn't mean any disrespect to Amendment number 2, which is uh, very thoughtful. Uh, the, the, the crimes we're talking about here, Mr. Deputy Speaker, are they're, they're disgusting. That they're, they're serious. They're cowardly. They're, they're mostly involving the strong on the weak. This is a control, of course, of control part of it. They're, they're mostly... I believe I acknowledge that some men suffer in this way, but let's face it, most of it is against women and children. And that's, that's the cowardly aspect of it. And the, in the amendment number one, it does refer to the 83% of rape cases, which, which don't um, achieve a recommendation for prosecution. Uh, I'm not the first here today to say that's absolutely appalling. And frankly, what, what is going on in the public prosecution service? If a woman is prepared to come forward, and there are various reasons why she, a woman may not want to come forward, uh, but if she's prepared to, to, to take, take, take the, the very bold step of coming forward and making this sort of complaint, I honestly believe that the success rate, should, to, to at least bring it to a trial, to bring a charge, should be better than 17 out of 100. It, it's, it's disgraceful. So the, the amendment calling for the Public Prosecution Service to work to improve rape prosecution and conviction rates is very valid. But I think in, in the rest of the UK, certainly in England and Wales, there, there has been an attempt to do this. And the PPS has uh, acknowledged the, a problem. They have acted on various recommendations and they have gone into a more thematic examination of the reasons why. They, they don't make this recommendation, and it hasn't produced an increase in the number of cases that are brought to trial. And I, you know, in terms of round numbers, we've got that many statistics here in my head is spinning, but the, you know, the, the 470 cases of rape in one year here, I think Claire Bailey mentioned this, reduced down to 77. Um, 
which actually produced a charge and whatever number produced a conviction, a very, very small number. So I do, I do wonder why, in, in this more enlightened age, women who have been violated in this way and parents on behalf of their children who have been abused don't report in greater numbers. I mean, it could be just a fear of publicity. They don't, they don't want to have their names brought out in court. They don't want to have to appear in court. It, it could be fear of the process, or it could be disenchantment, frankly, with the process, because the process is so plainly letting, letting victims down. It, it could be in terms of the residual culture that exists in this country, that there's, a, there's an element of, of, of shame, of guilt, that a, 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 a mother, a, a wife, who is perhaps abused in this way, may, may still cling to the fact or the belief that this happened to her because she wasn't a good wife. I, I'm not going to use, try and use the word deserved it, because that would be absolutely improper, but I think there's still in this country a, a wee bit of a feeling that the, a wife is secondary to the husband and that some husbands would take advantage of that. I would say to the minister, um, I know she, Claire has made the promise that uh, she will bring forward legislation um, in terms of course of uh, control and domestic abuse. Uh, I hope she can do it inside the time scale of before next June because she did say she wouldn't bring any primary legislation through before next June. When, when she does bring it forward, um, it, it's only fair to point out that there, there is a considerable body of work already done by the department. And David Ford has had, you know, I'll give him a plug, he, he did a lot of work on this. There's, there's groundwork there, which you can uh, build on. You know, somebody mentioned the difficulty of a definition. There are very good definitions already on the record. I would ask the member to draw his remarks to a close, and, please. Um, I, I just I hope that um, as a result of this, and as a result of this talking debate that we had only two or three weeks ago, that we'll start to stop talking about this and actually take some members action. Members' time is up. We'll support the motion and the amendment. Okay. I call Pam Cameron. Thank you, um, Deputy Speaker, and I welcome the opportunity to speak on this motion today. Since 2007, I have been uh, involved locally with Women's Aid, ABCLN, primarily in an attempt to raise awareness of domestic violence. I cannot praise the work of the staff and the volunteers highly enough in providing support to women and children in crisis situations. And I would like to take this opportunity just to uh, commend the CEO, Rosemary McGill, MBE, who, despite dealing with her own personal um, adversity, continues to be the driving force behind the organisation in her single-minded approach uh, to stamping out domestic violence. The wording of this motion, of course, includes rape and sexual crime, which can be equally insidious, sinister and cloaked in fear. Indeed, only a few weeks ago, my colleague Brenda Hale brought a motion to the floor of the House in relation to stalking. These heinous acts are all founded in inflicting fright and terror on victims and are often perpetrated by those seeking to exert control over others. When I first began my work with Women's Aid, I was told an account of a story of an elderly couple in their 80s living together in a care home to accommodate the wife's dementia needs. The staff in the home became concerned about unexplained bruises which kept appearing on the elderly lady. They spoke to the couple's GP who disclosed that there was a 60 year, and I repeat that, a 60 year history of domestic abuse within the marriage and that the family was aware of it. What transpired was that the husband was repeatedly beating and raping his wife in the privacy of their room at night time. And I trust that everyone here today is as shocked as I was to hear that story um, and that particular incident. Although this is one individual case which I'm quite confident in saying that there must be many, many such cases where this type of abuse is allowed to continue over a lifetime with no one being prepared to act in defence of the victim. It demonstrates the all-encompassing way which domestic violence can manifest itself and become such an intrinsic part of someone's life that they cannot even see how awful the reality has become. Whether it's through physical violence, sexual violence, or mental, emotional, and financial abuse, domestic violence knows no boundaries and affects every age group, every race, religion, and class. It must also be said that although the majority of women uh, victims are women, men should not be forgotten in the discussion 
on domestic abuse. Although we do recognise that, and we've heard from the proposer, that um, the majority of victims are indeed female, and in turn, their children are often used as a method to coerce the woman, and with, of course, those lasting damaging effects that that, that has on children. Alongside Women's Aid, ABCLN, I recently formed an all-party group on domestic violence by way of engaging with the departments on the implementation of the Stopping Domestic and Sexual Violence Abuse Strategy and to ensure these issues are kept on the agenda. At our last meeting on the 27th of September, we heard from the Department of Health and the Department of Justice and I was incredibly encouraged to hear that the joint strategy has had a great deal of momentum and both departments are committed to the outworking of this strategy. I was particularly heartened on hearing the, of the reconstitution of the interministerial group, which had previously formed, but in my opinion, had made little progress. I look forward to seeing the Departments of Health and Justice in their co-leadership roles to ensure that the effective delivery of the five strands of the strategy. I'm also pleased to hear that the Department of Justice is reviewing arrangements of the multi-agency risk assessment conferences, or MARACs as we know them, for victims who are at very high risk of domestic violence and that uh, funding has been committed to these. I've had numerous discussions with the Minister for Justice and would like to commend her on her public commitment and pledge to tackling domestic and sexual violence. I'm aware that she has instructed her officials to look at best practice on the issue across other jurisdictions to ensure our justice system is properly equipped and capable of responding in an effective and efficient manner. This news can only be welcomed and I look forward to scrutinise its findings and proposals as it works through the Justice Committee. Um, in closing, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, I am aware that the focus of my remarks have centred on the issue of domestic abuse and I have only touched on rape and sexual crime. However, the message is the same. Whether it is physical violence against a partner, unwanted sexual conduct, controlling or coercive behaviour or stalking, it must not be tolerated. And we do need additional legislation to tackle the subject, and we need to drive home the message that domestic violence, in whatever form, is I'll not socially acceptable. Close, we must do all we can to deliver this message, and doing so, provide the necessary support to allow victims to come forward and report the offender to the authorities, and terminate to ensure that those who carry out these crimes Members are dealt up. with swiftly under the law and perpetrators Members are brought to justice. I support the motion. Thank you. Uh, Michaela Boyle. I call Michaela Boyle. Um, I'm proud to speak in this motion today uh, and uh, to send out my support and that of my parties to victims of domestic violence, not only here in Ireland but throughout the world. And I'm also saddened today to hear that there are some members here that would demean this very highly emotive motion to score political points. Domestic violence in all of its form is a crime and we as legislators all have to work harder to tackle it. Domestic abuse may be psychological, physical, sexual, emotional, verbal, or a combination of these, and I also acknowledge that men can also be victims of domestic abu abuse. Domestic violence is one, of only, is one of the only crimes where it can feel like the victim has been punished rather than the perpetrator. And instead of receiving support, victims of domestic violence are often criticised. How often have we heard it? It's her own fault. She should have left him the first time. That is easy for someone to say, but we must remember that apart from the physical difficulty of escaping from a controlling, violent partner, women who have been abused, beaten and degraded have little confidence and their self-esteem is at rock bottom. Women's refuges play a crucial role, and they are so much more than a roof over a head. Lives are transformed as specialist refuge workers support women to stay safe and provide them with any advice that they may, may need. Without adequate refuge provision, women experience domestic violence will be faced with a stark choice, flee to live rough on the streets if they have no family support, or remain with their abuser and risk of further violence, or even worse, in some cases, death. Escaping domestic violence is a traumatising and emotional process, and my heart goes out to anyone having to live with this. I too recently met with Foyle Women's Aid to discuss their work on tackling all forms of domestic violence against women. Women's Aid provides support and refuge services for women and their children 
suffering from mental, physical or sexual abuse. And as an MLA in a rural constituency, I am always very concerned about the plight of rural victims around domestic violence. Many rural, rural women in this situation can particularly feel isolated and distressed in the belief that they have no one to turn to. Women's Aid provides a critical lifeline to these women and I am hugely appreciative of their outreach efforts into the rural areas. Many topics were discussed at the meeting, including cross-border initiatives, early intervention, the One Safe Place <coughs> Plan and the importance of domestic homicide reviews. And indeed, the PPS uh, need to review their test for prosecution. I also recently met, like others, Alicia Perry, a strong independent woman who has survived domestic violence, abuse and coercive control. Alicia met with us to raise awareness of her campaign around Donna's Law. Donna was a, a friend of hers who unfortunately was a victim of domestic violence and died a few years ago. This law, Donna's Law, would seek to make domestic violence, domestic abuse but more importantly, coercive control, a criminal offence here in the north of Ireland. Domestic violence and abuse is happening at an alarming rate, and unfortunately it is happening amongst many young people, including teenagers. All victims, unfortunately, aren't speaking out because everything that has happened is trivialised and minimised by their controlling partners. Coercive control goes way beyond just more than controlling what their partners do, but more about how they think about their family, friends, colleagues, and more importantly, themselves. And I was also shocked to learn from Alicia that experts believe that domestic violence does occur in the LGBT community, with the same amount of frequency and severity as in the heterosexual community. Society's long history of entrenched racism, sexism, homophobia and transphobia prevents LGBT victims of domestic violence from seeking help from the police We'd ask and the, the legal to court to systems. Close, please. To conclude, Kankolia, it is clear that we need to do more to assist with the service provision and funding to this sector. And I welcome to date the work that Members the Minister has taken forward on this and I'm happy to support her as a Justice Committee member. Okay. I call Sammy Douglas. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I rise as a member of the Justice Committee um, to support the motion but also to support the, the two amendments as well. Um, when I look back on my own generation um, growing up, in my street and witnessing situations where it was never called domestic abuse but it was a form of abuse in terms of outside of particularly um, violence against women. You would have had um, women um, going about with uh, actually makeup on because um, their partner or their husband had, had actually physically attacked them. But for me, the, it was a culture of domination, a culture of control. And sadly today, um, we are talking about some of those issues. And I think it was the minister had mentioned a psychology of domestic abuse. And certainly when I look back, growing up as a young lad in my street, there was that psychology of domestic abuse where the father, the husband, the partner um, wouldn't allow his spouse or his partner um, to go to the pictures, as an example. Or um, it was about um, what friends they had to control their friends, the spending um, of money or the non-spending of money, um, and a whole range of those issues. And looking back, that was domestic abuse, but I'd never heard of the term um, until this last uh, number of years. But so sadly, we're still dealing with those issues. But the good thing is that we are debating this um, today about those issues. And it's more up front. And with all the difficulties of, of um, vulnerable people being able to go to PSNI or the Women's Aid, that these things are now um, been, been challenged. Um, 
I was on the internet today, and it was the it was a BBC News bulletin this last week, and it showed images of a young woman, Terry Louise Graham, who was unrecognisable in terms of the beating um, that she had taken in 2011. And she was calling for us, we need to do more. And I would certainly say that I welcome them, the Justice Minister been here, but also her comments recently when she said, tackling domestic abuse is my number one priority, and I'm committed to changing the law. And the chairman of our committee said that he's 100 per cent behind the, the, uh, our Justice Minister. I'm going to say I'm 150 per cent behind the Justice Minister, and she certainly will have our support, and I think she has our support um, right throughout the, this House. I looked up some facts and figures today um, provided by Women's Aid, an excellent organisation as my colleague um, Pam Camus has mentioned, and also the PSNI. And I was shocked at some of the statistics. I have heard of some of these statistics before, but to see them in writing was an absolute shock. Things like, in 2011, the PSNI reported that they were responding to a case of domestic violence every 23 minutes. It is endemic um, throughout um, society, and thank God that we are um, doing something about it. The police attend to an average of 60 domestic cases per day in Northern Ireland. And I think one of my colleagues had mentioned about the cost of domestic um, violence. Recent figures will show something like £180 million per year. So there is a cost to this, but there is also a cost reduction if we can address this, if we can um, combat, uh, combat this. Um, and of course, domestic violence um, it occurs mostly and commonly against women, but it's also a growing number of men. I think the latest statistics showed that there was a 49% increase in domestic violence against um, men, but it's also against children as well, because they're in the house when they see the abuse. They, they're in the house when that partner is um, controlling and, and abusing that, um, the, the spouse or their, their, their friends or their, um, their wife or whatever. And one of the most harrowing statistics we have uh, come across is that 30 per cent of all domestic violence starts to be a yes. close, please. And I want to finish and say, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, we are dealing with monsters in our society, and we should ev use every measure that we can to combat this, and I support the motion and the amendments. Thank you. I call Joanne Dobson. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Before I start my contribution, Mr. Speaker, could I ask the members of the House to keep the two young girls who were knocked down in Banbridge this afternoon in their thoughts and prayers? Um, it's a tragedy that domestic violence and sexual crime is one of the most common yet least reported crimes in Northern Ireland. Of course, we are not unique in that respect, but nonetheless, the fact that there are women and men today suffering violence at such endemic rates is absolutely heartrending. And I know from talking with PSNI offers how the all too rare initial bravery of reporting an incident can often dissolve with many reports withdrawn soon after, compounding the misery and the pain. Domestic violence can manifest itself in many ways, but most often it is in the form of verbal or emotional abuse with direct or implied threat of violence. And the nature of the abuse means it is often recurring, sometimes for many years, so it has a particularly cruel effect on victims. I remember chairing a session of the Commonwealth Women Parliamentarians on domestic violence, where uh, an older lady presented us with her own personal domestic abuse experience. And she told us in graphic details how she did her induction to married life at the end of her husband's fist and how it took her 20 years to escape his grasp. So I think this sad message of her presentation was that, from other gender, this is an all too common experience. I'm sure there are people, particularly those with no experience of abuse, who ask the question, why would anyone stay? And it's a question that no members in this House have even pondered to themselves. But I believe that it's too simplistic a question for what is often an incredibly complicated situation. We need to remember that tackling this form of abuse, whether it's physical or mental, 
is incredibly difficult because the aggressor is in or has been in a long-term relationship or marriage with their victim. Yes, no problem. Take our point with regards to well, how you know people ask the question, well, how can you stay in that uh, abusive relationship? And it is very complex, and sometimes with youngsters involved, it's, it's a threat to them as much as anything else. But would the member agree with me that if the, if, if the department would bring in the domestic violence disclosure scheme? to work alongside the Child Protection Disclosure Scheme, that some of those people may not end up in an abusive relationship if they're able, if they had the right to ask before they would endeavour into a relationship? The member's an extra minute. Yeah, can I, I thank the member for his intervention? Uh, and I know, speaking to constituents, the, uh, keeping their children safe is key and is, is certainly a priority. Um, even in spite of the violence, as we know, many will still be bound to their partners by strong feelings of loyalty and, and even love. So even more challenging are the circumstances where the abuser is a parent of their children. Victims are torn as to what to do about the abuse, or, or as they understand, we may be keen to maintain the family unit and may see that as more important consideration than their own welfare or even their own safety. The facts of growing up um, in the midst of domestic violence can be devastating for children. The feeling of fear and confusion that those poor children experience when they see abuse, it must be awful, never mind the abuse when it comes with, with their parents. So I'd ask the Minister whether um, she is satisfied that all the required support mechanisms are in place to support these young people. Mr. Deputy Speaker, domestic violence isn't some sort of faceless crime where someone unknown can come and go. It's often a warped battle between feelings of love and absolute betrayal. But that doesn't mean the justice system shouldn't respond. It must, and it must plan a response for each individual case. Unfortunately, however, as we heard time and time in this debate, sadly, the current rudimental rudimentary response isn't working and too many cases are simply ending up without punishment. Often one of the first places to begin with, with would be the immediate response after a report to lessen, as I said earlier, the chances that it could be withdrawn the next day. I, I doubt there are a few things more gut-wrenching than a victim leaving with a violent partner, often breaking up that family unit, only to see the accuser get off scot-free. So that fear must be absolutely terrifying for them. Minister, I really do hope um, you listen to today's debate. You've said domestic violence is your key priority. I hope in your remarks shortly you will be detailing exactly the steps you're going to take to deliver the improvements for the victims of this appalling crime. Thank you. I call Lord Morrow. Thank you, uh, Deputy Speaker. And uh, I must say that I've listened to some very interesting comments right around the House today. I was particularly struck by what Doug Beattie said. And not so much even what he said, but rather the man that said it, because Doug Beattie was a professional soldier, so he would have come up through a hard school. And he would have been in what we would call a war zone situation. And it takes a lot of courage to do that. And uh, I listened very intently to him here today, and it proves not only is he a professional soldier, but indeed he has a heart too. And uh, I think he did touch and hit all the right buttons on this particular occasion, and I uh, commend him for it. And I listened, and I thought that perhaps my constituency was maybe the worst for this type of uh, violence. Uh, but as I listened to others coming from different constituencies, I recognised that that is not the case. And I have made representation in the past uh, to both uh, ministers, the previous one and to the existing one, in, in relation to that, and also to the chief constable. And I'm sure others have done uh, similar. But it is very difficult to pick up your local newspaper and not read about domestic abuse. And you know, folks, this assembly just needn't talk the talk. We've got to walk the walk. And it's all fine. Everybody here in harmony saying that something needs to be done, and it does need to be done. But actions always speak massively louder than words. And on that, in, we're very fortunate, I think, in, in the Dungannon Court, uh, 
is fortunate to have a judge, a foremost district judge by the name of John Meehan, who has a particularly de taken a particularly determined stance in tackling domestic violence and dealing with the perpetrators by coming at the case from the perspective of the victim. And that's the way he always comes across, and I think that's to be welcomed, so it is. And, the, and trying to encapsulate the trauma that they have been uh, endured. He's also very stoic in ensuring and safeguarding of victims through stringent bail conditions and cases progress through, as cases progress through the system. Now, I'm not sure what it's like in other areas, but I mean, I think I would want to commend that judge for the stand that he has taken and the degree of determination that he has brought to the bench in dealing with these cases. The sad and startling statistic, Deputy Speaker, is this, that victims will endure on average 30 attacks of abuse before they will take any action, if in fact they take any action at all. Now that is a very alarming figure. And I think it tells you something about society as a whole. If victims have to be traumatized on 30 occasions on average before they do anything. There must be a lack of confidence or something in the system that they don't feel that they're going to or they can come out and complain. I have worked very closely with a number of persons involved in the prevention of domestic... Yes, I will. <clears throat> Brief. Is it the fact that we have no specific legislation on domestic violence and stalking? Uh, is that the reason, one of the reasons, why people have no confidence to come forward? Members, next a minute. Well, I've just heard recently about a case where um, a person, the female in this case, was uh, stabbed her husband or partner, and uh, he broke her jaw in return. Now, whenever that goes to court, what happens? That's a 50-50, I suspect, and it won't travel anywhere. So therefore, and it should be noted, um, Mr. W. Speaker, that I don't believe that this domestic violence always comes from one side, the male. I believe it also comes from females, no disrespects to them. But maybe the prevalent side is the male side. And I want to say another thing. I believe that at the heart and the root of much of this violence, there's one word, alcohol alcohol abuse. And that seems to be one of the drivers of this domestic violence. Not entirely, not entirely, but I believe it is very, very prevalent. And I learned that too very much whenever I was taking uh, a PMB through this house in relation to human trafficking and exploitation. I got a, a real insight into incidents of violence, maybe of a different nature, but very much akin. And I was taught many things as a result of that. Any wonder that I was so uh, enthusiastic about trying to get this bill in, into statute and onto the, uh, uh, the books so that in future this type of behaviour would stop. Now, let's show to the world and the, our own country outside that we are not just here to talk fine words, but we're here to do something about it. And I think if the Minister uh, shows that determination, and she has said it's her number one priority, and I welcome that. Well, I think we'll all look into her today to tell us in a very direct way what measures she intends to bring forward, how she is going to tackle this issue, because it has to be, it's like a cancer in our society, and it has to be tackled. And the sooner that happens, it couldn't happen soon enough, uh, Deputy Speaker. Thank you. Iram, sir, Nicola Malm. I call Nicola Malm, but just before I do so, uh, just to remind the member that she has three minutes and to advise her that I have to call the minister at five to six and if you take any intervention during that time I won't be able to allocate you an extra minute. Thank you. Speaker, um, home is the place where you should feel safe. A place where you can go to after a hard and trying day and you close the door and you feel relaxed and you feel protected. Yet for many, many women and men the reality is very different. It's the place that they fear the most, the place where lies the greatest danger. And the proliferation of this abuse in our society is shocking. Incidences of domestic abuse have reached a 10-year high. Every day, according to the very latest statistics, police respond to 78 reports of abuse in the home a day. That equates with one report every 18 minutes. 
And while it is positive news, Mr Deputy Speaker, that, that the number of reported incidences have increased, the truth is that domestic abuse and sexual crime is still significantly underreported because of the nature of the physical and mental abuse and the intimacy often of the relationship of the abuser, especially when children are involved, or because of the abuse of power and authority and the fear of not being believed or being vilified when it is a large institution, a perceived celebrity or an organisation against an individual. But, Mr Deputy Speaker, as many members have pointed out, domestic abuse is violence, but it is not just violence. Psychological abuse, the exercise of fear and control, can be as bad and often worse than physical abuse. And what is shocking is the fact that under our current legislation, an abuser can break the spirit and the will of their victim. They can ruin their lives by a psychological torment without breaking the law. The SDLP therefore welcomes and we commend the fact that the Minister has given a commitment to tackling this injustice by outlawing coercive control in the North within the ambitious time frame of one year. Tackling domestic abuse, rape and sexual crime is not the task of one body, but it requires one approach, and that is one of zero tolerance based on three strands, prevention, protection and prosecution. My colleague, Mark H. Durkin, has outlined why we have included a specific reference to justice support workers in our amendment, and he has outlined why access to those workers for all victims is crucial. We would ask the Minister to share with us her views on that proposal, which I can assure her has the support of Women's Aid, the Men's Advisory Project, Men's Action Network, Nexus and Victim Support NI. As I draw my comments to a close, Mr Speaker, in the reduced time frame, I want to put on record and pay tribute to all of the organisations, the staff and the volunteers who work with victims. But most of all, I want to pay tribute to the courage of victims the remarks, who Chair, have please. spoken out. It is because of them and those who are suffering this torment and who have, have not spoken out that we must act. Okay. Um, before I call the Minister, as the business on the order paper isn't expected to be disposed of by 6 p.m., in accordance with Standing Order 10.3, I will allow business to continue until 7 p.m. or until the business is completed. I now call the Minister for Justice, Ms. Claire Sugden, to respond. Uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker. Um, I would like to thank the members for proposing this motion and those who have tabled amendments. Um, just to say from the outset, I am happy to support both amendments, albeit uh, uh, the, the mutually exclusive nature of it. Um, because domestic and, uh, domestic and sexual violence and abuse are issues which concern all of us. And I do welcome the opportunity to debate this issue in the Chamber today and the interest that has been shown by all corners of this House. I have already stated publicly that tackling domestic and sexual abuse is one of my priorities as Justice Minister, not just because of the harm that it causes to uh, victims, um, Deputy Speaker, but because of the wider societal impacts that domestic abuse has right across uh, Northern Ireland. Domestic violence takes many forms. It can be mental and emotional abuse, controlling, coercive or threatening behaviour designed to isolate manipulate or terrorize a victim in, into complete fearful obedience, physical and sexual violence and rape, or a com combination of all of, the all of the above. Mr. Deputy Speaker, it can result in death. None of these behaviors are acceptable. None should be tolerated. Domestic violence abuse is not a one-off incident, incident in an otherwise healthy relationship. It is an ongoing pattern of behavior that continue for weeks, months, years, or even decades. And I do think it is important that we emphasise that it doesn't have to be physical violence. Uh, we have to emphasise that it doesn't have to be just physical violence involved for it to be of domestic abuse. Slap me, punch me, kick me, but don't put me through one more hour of mental torture. Victims have told me that the physical abuse in itself they're almost numb towards. However, that psychological abuse that is imposed upon them, that's, that's where it tends to break the victims. Because abuse, whatever form it takes, has a devastating impact on the victim, and it is well evidenced that the negative impact of the psychological abuse and course of control can be just as traumatic as the experience of being physically attacked. And I know to, um, from speaking uh, with survivors of domestic abuse that the compound effect of sustained physical, emotional, financial and sexual abuse can be totally life-shattering. Domestic and sexual violence and abuse can affect anyone, 
no matter where they live or how much money they have. Equally, perpetrators of domestic abuse are as likely to be lawyers, doctors, accountants, politicians, as well as those who are unemployed. Domestic violence knows no boundaries. It does not discriminate with regard to age, marital status, race, ethnicity or religious group, sexual orientation, social class, disability or geography. It affects women, men and those from the LGBT community. Some members of the House have speculated why people commit domestic abuse. And it's not something that I, I understand. Perhaps it's alcohol, as suggested by Lord Morrow. Addiction, mental health issues, or trauma. Perhaps the perpetrators were victims themselves. Whether we realize it or not, every one of us in this chamber will know someone who is suffering at the hands of a violent and controlling abuser. This may be a family member, a work colleague, a friend, or even an acquaintance. Let's not forget the hidden victims, and I'm glad other members have alluded to it, our children. Statistics provided to me by Women's Aid indicate that in 2006 there were approximately 32,000 children living with domestic violence in Northern Ireland, and that in 1415, 13 babies were born to mothers living in refuge. Clearly evidence that we need to do more. Many victims themselves are unaware, are unaware that they are, what their experience is actually domestic abuse. And some may argue that the, the abusive man or woman has just lost control. The truth is that that person is very much in control and their actions are designed to intimidate and frighten their victim over a sustained period of time with a view of denying the victim their personhood. I often hear the comment and other members have alluded to it, if it was that bad, why not just leave? But it can be extremely difficult to leave an abusive partner. And the woman, for example, may have um, the fear of what the partner will do if she does, particularly if she has children. Evidence has shown that the point of separation is the time when a victim is most likely to be killed or seriously injured. She may not have access to money or anywhere to go, or may not know where to turn for help. When the victim is elderly or lives in an isolated rural community, seeking help can become even more challenging for a variety of reasons. Often a woman's self-esteem and confidence has been totally eroded by her experiences and her, abusers may, um, her abuser may have convinced her that the abuse was her fault and that no one will believe her or that, she was, or that she is useless or will not manage on her own. One woman told me, I covered it up for so long because I was embarrassed and ashamed. I'm an educated woman and I was ashamed that I allowed it to happen. Another said every time it happened, he made me feel like it was my fault, that I deserved it. One woman talked about her, how her partner had systematically isolated her from her family and friends, cut off access to her finances and prevented her from using a car. She said, even if I could have gotten away, where would I have went? She had no one. Consequently, many victims, both men and women, suffer in silence with no hope of an, of an escape from their situation. And we have seen such tragedies in our own community in the recent past. Since 2010, 22 women and 10 men have lost their lives to domestic violence in Northern Ireland. In my view, the death of one person is too many, and we must act now to stop this. PSNI statistics note that approximately 28,000 domestic abuse incidents were reported in 1516, the highest level recorded since the data series began in 2004-05. Around 3,000 incidents of sexual offences were recorded in 1516, an increase of 11.3% compared to the previous year. And in 1516, the number of rape incidents recorded increased by 5.8% to 780, and other sexual offences increased by 13.3% to 2,257. And I do believe that this upturn in reporting illustrates an increase in victims' confidence in the support services uh, available to them as they seek protection and justice through initiatives now in place, such as the multi-agency risk uh, assessment conferences and their own centre, and this is to be welcomed. However, it is widely accepted that domestic and sexual violence continues to be underreported. From talking to representatives from the uh, voluntary and community sector, such as Women's Aid, who provide frontline services to victims of domestic and sexual abuse and the victims of violence themselves, I have learned that there are a number of reasons for this. Often women do uh, fear the repercussions of coming forward. One woman told me she didn't press charges against her abuser for fear that he would come back and finish her off as a punishment for reporting his actions. Another said she had endured so much already she just could not bear the thought of reliving her drama in court. 
She wanted her ordeal to be over so that she and her child could get on with the rest of their lives in peace. So, Mr Deputy Speaker, this, that is why I am committed to enhancing the current justice system, to encourage victims to come forward, safe in the knowledge that they will be protected, not just from their abuser, but from their trauma of re-victimisation. And I do um, uh, take on board the comments made uh, by the SDLP in terms of the support services available, and I think it's definitely something that we should consider, because as many members noted, this isn't for myself alone, or the Health Minister, or the Minister of Communities, or Education, or even indeed the entire Executive, but this is for this House and wider uh, society in Northern Ireland to really shine a light on a, such a dark shadow. Domestic violence is a unique crime which requires a unique response and as an executive we have already made efforts to address domestic and sexual violence and abuse through the previous tackling violence at home and tackling sexual violence and abuse strategies, strategies which were published in 2005 and 8 respectively. But we must do more. In March 2016, following executive endorsement, the Department of Health and Justice published the Stopping Domestic and Sexual Violence and Abuse Strategy, a new strategy to address both issues. The vision of the strategy is to have a society in Northern Ireland in which domestic and sexual violence is not tolerated in any form, where effective, tailored, preventative and responsive services are provided, where all victims are supported and where all perpetrators are held to account. It is challenging, Mr Deputy Speaker, but, it is what, which I, but one which I believe is achievable if we work together as an executive and an assembly to effect positive change and improve the lives of thousands of women and men and children in Northern Ireland for the better. In producing the strategy, there was extensive co consultation and engagement with a wide range of interested groups, including statutory, um, community and voluntary sector, and indeed the victims themselves. The consultation sought views on whether a specific offence should be created that captures patterns of coercive and controlling behaviour in intimate relationships in line with the proposed new definition of domestic abuse contained within the draft Stopping Domestic and Sexual Violence and Abuse Strategy. Having considered the responses to the consultation, I have now committed to bringing um, both a domestic abuse offence and a domestic violence disclosure scheme to Northern Ireland. Um, and I, I, in, in light of uh, previous debate around stalking, I'm considering uh, how we can implement this into the legislation also. This domestic abuse offence will recognise the repetitive nature, behaviour and cumulative effect of domestic violence and abuse on victims and the devastating impact that this can have on mental health. The disclosure scheme will provide potential victims with the right to ask for the disclosure of relevant information which will enable them to make informed decisions with regard to continuing their relationship. My officials will be briefing the Justice Committee on these subjects later this month and I would welcome their, their views and opinions on how we can take this forward. I am aware that significant work will be required to embed this new offence and that will of course require the provision of training and guidance for all rel relevant criminal justice practitioners against the backdrop of a challenging financial environment and limited resources. Nevertheless, Mr Deputy Speaker, I can assure you that I am committed to ensuring the offence is implemented effectively in Northern Ireland and my officials will work with practitioners to identify the training and resources needed as soon as possible. In addition to the introduction of a domestic violence offence, I am committed to raising awareness and to achieving the changes and attitudes that are necessary to end violence against women, children and men. Ultimately, I want to improve the experience of victims so that they are treated as we would all want to be treated if we were in their shoes. And I take Mr Beatty's point around this needs to be an education, it needs to be changing the mindset. We need to educate our young boys that it's not okay to treat women a particular way and we need to educate our girls that it's okay to say no. A victim charter placed on a statutory footing in November 2015 advises victims of crime about their entitlements as well as the standards of service that they can expect when they come into contact with the criminal justice system. It builds on the good work that has been done to date, including the setting up of a victim and witness care unit that provides a single point of contact for victims to receive information about their case and have their needs assessed for additional support. We will shortly be piloting the pre-recorded cross-examination of vulnerable and intimidated victims and witnesses, which could include victims of domestic and sexual abuse and violence. This will enable victims to give evidence ahead of their trial, away from the main courtroom, away from their abuser, and in a place that they feel supported. The Interministerial Group on Domestic and Sexual Violence and Abuse oversees the delivery of the new strategy, and I am pleased to co-chair that group along with Minister uh, O'Neill. As I co-chair that group, I will be fully engaged in the development of all future action plans. I anticipate that members of the IMG can, by working together over the lifetime of the strategy, provide the direction that is needed to make a significant difference to these issues.
A cooperative approach is essential, Mr Deputy Speaker, if, if, the, if the awareness raising, early intervention and preventative action which is necessary to address these issues is to be effective. I note the concerns uh, raised regarding the prosecu prosecutorial decisions and would advise that this is a matter for the Public Prosecution Service to consider. But I meet regularly with the DPP and I'm quite happy to share the views of this House in relation to this area. Um, I think it's important that in terms of moving this forward, I cannot say that this is just the job for the Executive, for this Assembly, but indeed the, the wider criminal justice family. Sure. Giving way. On, that, on that very point, there, there has been cases whereby because someone who's been convicted of, of uh, sexual abuse has got a lesser sentence by a number of years and then let out uh, on probation, and because they didn't complete their full term in prison, they were able to then get themselves off the sex offenders list. That's one aspect then that could ripple down with regards to any disclosure scheme that we may have in, 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 in statute. So would the Minister seek to look out and investigate that case and those cases? Uh, yes, I appreciate the, the Chair of the Justice Committee's comments and indeed when we, we bring these issues to the Committee I, you know, I would be keen to, to delve further into the, the particular areas that he, he raises because there, there are difficulties within the system currently and I think it's, you know, it's important that we acknowledge it if we are effective in trying to tackle uh, domestic abuse. Um, I would like to take this opportunity, Deputy Speaker, to highlight a facility for those who have experienced sexual violence. The Rowan Sexual Assault Referral Centre was established in May 2014 and offers a range of services and support to victims of sexual violence. Jointly funded by the Department of Health and the PSNI, since going live in May 2013, over 2,500 individuals have been referred to the Rowan, and I have no doubt that the excellent work of the centre has contributed to an increase in reported sexual crimes. Mr Deputy Speaker, we have an opportunity today to, to clearly commit to working together to address domestic abuse, rape and sexual crime. As elected representatives, we have the opportunity to raise these issues within our own constituencies through, for example, ensuring that our offices are safe places for victims of domestic and sexual violence to approach and seek support. Within, within my own uh, East London Dairy constituency, I have been designated as a safe place. The Causeway Coast and Glens Borough Council is taking forward initiatives um, such as the Onus Safe Village Initiative and the Onus Gold Award status, including the development of a workplace Just charter. Just remind the minister it's coming near close. Abuse with uh, associated trading and staff. We all have a role to play uh, on this, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, because we are all affected by domestic abuse and we have a responsibility to speak out against it and only then will it end. Alex Atwood, call Alex Atwood to wind on amendment number two. Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And uh, as my colleagues indicated, we will not divide the House in relation to uh, the two amendments, uh, and will support the Green Amendment in that regard. Um, and if you think about it, Mr. Deputy Speaker, uh, today does tell the narrative, or should tell the narrative, of this mandate. Uh, because at lunchtime, uh, uh, victims and survivors of institutional and clerical produce, abuse uh, produced further proposals in respect of uh, uh, financial redress, given the horrors that they experienced many years ago and continue to this day. And here, at the end of the day, uh, we have a debate in relation to uh, the abuse of particularly women, but men and women, in Northern Ireland society. So a defining feature of this mandate should be what we are doing in terms of support uh, for victims and survivors, uh, whether they suffer historic abuse or whether it's current abuse. And in that regard, I want to press the Minister in a number of points that were raised during the course of the debate. Uh, the first is my colleague, uh, Mr. H Mark H. Durkin, referred to uh, the rollout of Justice Support Worker Scheme across Northern Ireland. Uh, that is something that's in, uh, endorsed uh, by uh, charities and organisations who work in support of women. I think it should be something that the Minister endorses and encourages the PSNI uh, to roll out. Um, the Minister referred to uh, her commitment to a legislation respective course of control, and all of us referred to that and all of us endorsed that. Uh, but there is now a commitment uh, for that legislation to be on the statute books in the course of next year. That's a challenging timetable. And therefore, I would uh, say to the Minister, there's a need to accelerate the process around all of that. 
to ensure that when we stand in this place in the autumn of 2017, that legislation is on the statute book and that which we all endorse uh, will have happened. The Minister uh, read into the record chilling uh, comments in respect of the number of children who are, affecting, who are affected by and living in an environment of abuse by a parent, uh, of a parent by a parent. Um, that suggests to me that there is still more work that, does, that is required arising from Stephen Agnew's Children's Cooperation Services Bill to ensure that those who are the most vulnerable in those abusive circumstances, uh, the very young in particular, are uh, every remedy and intervention is pursued in relation to all of that. And I thought that Claire Bailey's comment in respect of the PPS publishing uh, figures uh, was a very worthwhile one. If the PSNI are reporting the highest number of cases of alleged abuse and real abuse since records began, then I think the PPS need to publish their records of what is coming on the far side of the reporting of all of that. And could I ask the Minister uh, to ensure that when she takes forward uh, the uh, panel report into the enduring legacy and influence of paramilitary organisations, she looks at the issue of whether there is control of communities and individuals subject to paramilitary or other organisations when it comes to this issue in the lives of people of Northern Ireland. Because there continues to be a narrative about the influence being brought to bear, including by people who claim to be associated or are involved in paramilitary organisations, uh, that they have a role when it comes to the abuse of individuals in our society. And I'd ask the Minister, when she's taken forward the, that work, uh, uh, to look at that issue. Uh, Mr Douglas referred to the bravery last week of Terry Louise Graham, and he was right to name it. But we are also right to name all those who have showed the same bravery, including and not least Maria Cahill, whose voice is still loud, whose dignity is still clear, and whose experience still endures in terms of warning to people in our society about the influence of those self-appointed people who think it is their job to deal with these issues. Uh, we don't play politics with this issue. We don't play politics with Maria Cahill. We don't play politics with all, any person who has been subject to abuse to account, from please. any organisation or society. It is uh, for others to judge whether others stand in solidarity with her and with them. I call Claire Bailey to end on amendment number one. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. And it's very heartening to hear support and such understanding on this issue from the House today, um, and as well as the, the Justice Minister's commitment to the work programme ahead. Um, as a member of the Justice Committee, I know that the committee are absolutely committed to working on this issue um, and look forward to scrutinising and helping where we can in terms of bringing forward any legislation. But I'd maybe just like to add in that I've heard a lot spoken about how men and women um, and how domestic abuse and long-term relations um, and the impacts of this violence on those. But um, suffice to say that Nexus also put out a report that states that one in four of us should expect to be abused at some stage in our lives. Much of that abuse occurs in childhood. And Nexus believes that a large number of our prisoners have suffered sexual abuse or exploitation. The links between poor mental health and childhood sexual abuse are well known. Clients present with suicide risks, addiction problems, low self-worth, depression, anxiety, and a plethora of other ailments. Our current rehabilitation system addresses some of the symptoms of trauma, for example, anger, alcohol, drug addiction, However, the underlying cause of the actual problem is often left unaddressed. So it's maybe the, we could start looking at what is causing this abuse. Maybe it's not the alcohol, but rather learned behaviour in our society when this level of abuse is so endemic. The, P, the Probation Board in Northern Ireland 
also need to mention because they do do much really good ongoing work, but they work with convicted perpetrators. However, this work can only be done because they have been convicted, and as our figures are showing us today, the majority go unconvicted and unaddressed. So there is much more that our judicial system should be capable of doing, much better, and as a matter of urgency, because as every day passes, new victims are created. So thank you. Okay, I guess now she hears her patchyhan. Le Cree Correlation Gis Brach there and Freo Waller. I Gorm. call Mr. Pat Sheehan to conclude and wind the debate on the substantive motion. Gorma over the last count Corla. Um, domestic violence is intentional and persistent abusive behaviour. It is, as many people have said here today, it's an ongoing pattern of abusive, coercive and controlling behaviour that can include physical, psychological, economic sexual and emotional abuse. By its nature, domestic abuse is not a, a single incident of violence in an otherwise healthy relationship. Domestic abuse is characterised by coercive control. Uh, Mark Durkin defined coercive control as a deliberate and calculated pattern of behaviour and psychological abuse designed to isolate, manipulate and terrorise a victim into complete fearful submission. Unfortunately, coercive control is not currently a crime here in the North, and I welcome uh, the Minister's uh, commitment to bringing forward legislation within the next year to make coercive control a crime. Because many victims of domestic abuse say that the coercive control element of their abuse is much more difficult to endure and recover from than physical violence. And this has been corroborated by victims and survivors of domestic abuse in other jurisdictions and right across the globe. Indeed, numerous studies have shown similarities between coercive control and tactics used to control hostages, prisoners of war and concentration camp inmates. The presence of coercive control in a relationship can be an effective indicator of the likelihood of serious violence resulting in the death of victims. Some victims of domestic homicide do not have a history of previous physical abuse, but they were victims of extreme forms of coercive control. And let's remember, because what we're talking about is a very serious issue. In 2014-15, there were six murders uh, with a domestic uh, motivation here in the North. In fact, 37.5 percent of all murders in the North were domestic related. And as has been pointed out, the PSNI responded to over 28,000 uh, domestic in incidents, 13 percent of all crime in this jurisdiction. And these statistics are just the tip of the iceberg. Lord Morrow pointed out that it takes an average of over 30 instances of abuse before a victim will report it. All of which shows that women are still more at risk of crime in the home than anywhere else. The crux of the matter here is that domestic violence is not in itself a criminal offence. Uh, instead, perpetrators are charged with regular offences such as assault, criminal damage, harassment and false imprisonment. And the PSNI records uh, the crime, that the crime had a domestic motivation for statistical purposes. The PSNI and the criminal justice system treats each occurrence of domestic violence as an individual incident. However, this is at odds with the nature of domestic violence, which is a pattern of abusive behaviour. The upshot of this is that most incidents of domestic violence are treated as minor crimes and misdemeanours, resulting in short or suspended sentences. The sentencing does not take account of the weeks, months or even years of psychological torture that the victim has been subjected to. And Pam Cameron gives us an horrendous example of a woman who had been abused for over 60 years, almost all of her lifetime being tortured and abused by her husband within her own home. And of course, uh, we, we've recently uh, heard the testimony of Terry Louise Graham, 
who was subjected to uh, absolute diabolical uh, abuse within her relationship. A domestic abuse offence uh, will send a strong message to perpetrators that they cannot act with impunity. And it will also send a message to victims that the abuse they have suffered will be taken seriously by the executive and by the legislators here in this assembly. In terms of securing convictions, innovative evidence collection approaches should be considered. These could include the use of a register showing the number of times police have been called to a house uh, in order to build a picture of the frequency and the nature of the, of the abuse. Uh, and there's also evidence that the police use of body cameras has led to a rise in convictions. Uh, and, uh, but there is also a need for a domestic violence disclosure scheme. And again, I welcome the Minister's commitment to introduce that into the legislation also. Because the fact is that uh, most people, most perpetrators of domestic violence are serial offenders, they're serial perpetrators. Uh, and if someone in, in a relationship becomes suspicious, she or he would be able to go to the police and find out if the person they're now in a relationship with has a history of domestic abuse. Uh, statutory agencies also have a role uh, to play in helping victims of domestic abuse. Uh, and I'll give you an example. If someone is uh, intimidated by paramilitaries and seek to be rehoused, their case is designated high priority by the housing executive. The same doesn't apply to victims of domestic abuse. And Alicia Parry's name has been mentioned on a number of occasions here today. And she has been waiting years to be rehoused with no success. So there needs to be changes there. And we must send out a clear message from this assembly that there will be zero tolerance of domestic abuse and coercive control. Uh, I commend the uh, motion to the House. I support the, uh, the two amendments. and uh, In fact, I think they add, both add to the motion. I also welcome the Minister's uh, commitment to look at the issue of uh, justice support workers. Uh, the victims and survivors of abuse have spoken to me uh, in glowing terms about the work they do, how much uh, easier it is to navigate through the criminal justice system with, with the help of these workers. So I leave it there, Kian Corlech Gormaga. Before I put the question on amendment number one, I would remind members that if it is made, I will not put the question on amendment number two. The question is that amendment number one, standing in the names of Ms. Claire Bailey and Mr. Stephen Agnew, be made. All those in favour say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. The question is that the motion as amended be agreed. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. And the motion as amended is now agreed and carried.